Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel and welcome back to another true crime video. I know it has definitely been quite a while since I have filmed another one of these and you guys have been highly, highly requesting them. I will say that there are going to be a lot more of them more often. I just needed a little bit of time to collect cases and to really sit down and do the proper research that each case deserves and needs. So thank you for being so patient with me. I know that a lot of you really enjoy these videos and I'm really, really glad that I get to provide them for you and spread awareness about these cases. Before we get into today's video though, I wanted to talk to you guys about something real quick. I don't know if you've noticed, you probably have, but I am wearing this really really nice Vincero watch on my wrist. I love that it's black. I think that that is so nice and classy and just like goes with everything. If you're unfamiliar with Vincero watches, I have featured them on my channel before. They're a watch company. They're actually located in my hometown, so I'm extremely proud to support them. Vincero specializes in making luxury watches. They're not a minimalist watch company. They are not a simple watch company. Vincero has created these incredibly classy watches that I am in love with. Vincero creates watches for both men and women, all ranging in a bunch of different styles and colors. They have mesh bands, which is what this one is. They also have leather bands. Their colors range from, from rose gold and silver and marble and all these really cool designs. I've never really been a watch girl up until recently and I was really looking for one that would completely just kind of like step up my game a little bit. And I really, really like this one. I love the black one because it goes with silver. It goes with gold it's super easy to style. This is what the packaging looks like. Each Vincero watch comes in this box. This is their mesh rose gold and white watch. This little guy right here is the tool that is going to help you size your watch so you can size it yourself. It's so easy, you guys. On the inside of each watch, I'm not sure if you can tell with this lighting right now, but it says, it says live your legacy, which is basically Vincero's motto, which I love. I think it is incredibly empowering and just throughout the day, you kind of feel a little bit like more motivated and strong. At least I do, I don't know. It's just like a really cool hidden message I feel like that no one else can see but like you know it's there. You know it's weird to say that like you're passionate about like a watch or something but I think it's so much more than that. I think it's the whole concept of live your legacy which in a way is like the whole be your best self thing that I always ingrain in you guys. So I am totally about that. I love that. I would never leave you guys hanging though without a discount code so I do have a code for you. It is SAV15. I will have all the links in the description box below for you guys to go check it out. The link in the description will take you directly to the page and make sure you use that code because you get 15% off your entire order, which is amazing. And with that being said, let's get right on into today's video. Part of the reason I wanted to cover this case so badly for you guys is because it has not gotten the exposure that it needs at all. There are so many missing holes in this story. There is definitely not enough information, but there has been a lot of updates in this case, which is another reason I wanted to kind of bring it to you guys. I think it's so important now more than ever, especially to keep talking about this case and keep spreading the word, keep getting Thomas's name out there. So Thomas Brown grew up in Canadian, Texas. Canadian is a super, super small town in Texas. There's about 2,500 to 2,700 people living in it. It's definitely one of those towns where everyone knows everyone and word travels extremely fast. Everyone knew Thomas in this town and everyone wanted to be his friend. Thomas was such a good person. He lived at home with his parents. His mom's name is Penny. He had an older brother named Tucker. And to just kind of give you a picture of who Thomas was as a person, he was class president two years in a row at Canadian High School. He had a bunch of different types of friends. He was super popular. He played football, but he he also was really into musical theater and he would always get really, really good supporting roles in the plays that he participated in. He was just very active in his community, very involved in a bunch of different things. Unfortunately, that all changed on November 26th of 2016. So Thomas's older brother, Tucker, had been off at school and college, but because it was Thanksgiving break, he had come back to spend time with his family and spend the holiday with them. And whenever Tucker would come home, him and Thomas would always hang out together, watch movies together, and this night was no different. Thomas and Tucker finished their movie at about 6 o'clock p.m. that night and Thomas told his mom that he was going to go hang out with a couple of his friends and asked her if he could borrow her debit card for gas money. Penny was completely okay with it. Thomas had a curfew of midnight and according to her, Thomas had really never broken curfew before. He would sometimes even come home before curfew because he would just hang out with his friends. They would play video games at his house, but he would always respect his curfew, always. She gave Thomas her debit card so he could use that for gas money and she just expected him to be home before or by his curfew that night. So Thomas left his house to go meet up with his two friends named Christian Webb and Caleb King. This happens a lot when it comes to really small towns. Um, there's not a lot to do on the weekends or at night. You know, there'll be the occasional like house party or something like that, but there's not a whole lot of like activities to do at night. So whoever's in that community kind of has to make up their own fun in a sense. Something that Thomas and his friends like to do though is they like to all get in the car together and drive around the town. They would drive around to different areas of the town. They would hang out in parking lots and just kind of 
post up and talk and hang out together. That was really like their typical like hanging out. And on November 26th, that was no different. Christian, Caleb, and Thomas all met up at the middle school in Canadian. They met up at the middle school parking lot. They all got into Christian's car together and they all started driving around town. She says they drove on to a bridge and then they kind of just walked to and from the bridge, got back in the car around 11 and all drove back to the middle school. Both Caleb and Christian said that when they left Thomas that night, he wasn't acting weird. He was acting completely normal. Nothing seemed wrong or different. Three of them even made plans to go over to Christian's house the next day for Thanksgiving. And Christian said the last words Thomas said were, see you tomorrow. So the surveillance tape from the middle school shows that Thomas left the parking lot and made a right and headed towards the gas station. Penny's debit card was swiped at 11.28 p.m. at a local gas station. And you would think after that, Thomas would get in the car and go back home. He had a midnight curfew. It wasn't too far off. And so you would think he would just get back in his car and drive home. But as time kept nearing more and more to midnight, Penny started getting more and more worried, especially because Thomas was never one to break curfew. He was never one to come home late, and he was certainly never one to not text anyone back or not let anyone know where he was or what he was doing. So, so when midnight rolled around and Thomas still wasn't home, Penny waited about 10 minutes before texting him, asking him where he was, if he was okay, and the text was read. And that is something that I think is very important to note. The text was read, but there was no response. And like I said, Thomas just wasn't that kind of guy. He wouldn't like not respond to his mom about being late for curfew or things like that or what he was doing or where he was going or if something happened. Penny texted him about two or three times with where are you? Are you okay? What's going on? All three of those texts were read with no response and that's when Penny really started to get panicked because she knew something was very wrong. So she ended up going into Tucker's bedroom that night and asking Tucker if he had heard from Thomas. Tucker was really confused because it was past Thomas's curfew and it was late at night and he hadn't heard from Thomas. So he told his mom no but immediately both of them knew that something wasn't right. So they both ended up taking separate cars and driving around Canadian seeing if they could see his car, seeing if they could find him. While she was driving trying to find Thomas she was still texting him about 30 minutes past midnight, Penny's messages to Thomas weren't going through at all, which indicated that obviously Thomas's phone was either dead or off. At that point, Penny got extremely, extremely worried. She started calling his friends. She started driving by his friend's houses. She drove by his girlfriend's house to see if she could see his car anywhere. And when Penny still wasn't able to locate Thomas at all, when Penny and Tucker still even weren't even able to locate Thomas at all, that is when Penny decided to call the sheriff's department. And remember what I said, Canadian is a really, really small town. There's 2,500 people in it. It's not like they're driving around this huge, crazy city at night. It's they're driving around a very small town where everyone knows everyone. They would have definitely seen Thomas's car if it was just out sitting out at some house somewhere. It wasn't till about 3.30 in the morning that police officers showed up to Penny's house, which is around the same time that she got home from her search. So she was out searching for hours and then ended up coming home at 3.30. That's when the police met her at her house and the police weren't super concerned about this. They kind of just thought that this was some teenage boy who either fell asleep somewhere or he just didn't come home at curfew or something like that. They really didn't take it super seriously at this point. But Penny knew. Penny knew this entire time that this was so much more than that. The next day, the whole community came together to try and help locate Thomas. Christian, who was actually one of the friends that was with Thomas the last night he was seen, her dad owned a helicopter business and so she told him about what happened to Thomas and how no one can find him and her dad actually went up in a helicopter and started circling the Canadian area seeing if he could find anything. Christian's dad flew over multiple areas including one called Lake Marvin and although they weren't able to locate Thomas they were able to locate his red Dodge Durango car. Lake Martin and Canadian Texas are eight minutes away from each other so eight minutes away from Thomas's hometown and five miles so Thomas did not go far. When the police showed up to the car they noticed that the passenger window was rolled down as well as all the doors were unlocked. According to Penny and Thomas's friends, the specific area of where Thomas's car was found was extremely odd and random and he had no reason of being there. Penny and his friends said that it was not somewhere that Thomas went very often and it was just really random. It was just not somewhere they would ever expect his car to be. At first glance, the car, other than the window being down and the doors being unlocked, there was no sign of a struggle. There was no window that was broken. The car seemed to be in good shape. Like nothing really seemed to be completely off about it. So as I continue to talk about this case, you're going to notice there is a a lot of back and forth between Penny and the sheriff at the time. So the sheriff is named Nathan Lewis. So I will get more into detail about the sheriff in a minute, but I do want to say that the sheriff's name is Nathan Lewis. He was new to the job. He had worked this job about two months. I think he was two months in when this case originally started. And I will get into more detail about it, but just 
as a basis, you will see that they did have a lot of conflicting opinions. The first being that according to Penny, when the case really started and when they found Thomas's car, the police department really tried to jump to suicide on this one. I can only imagine like as a mother knowing your kid and you know your kid so well, like Thomas and his mom were so close and she knew him more than anyone and to hear that, to just know that something's not right with something but being told otherwise, being told it was suicide when you just know it wasn't, like I cannot even imagine how aggravating and frustrating that would be. But that's really what the police wanted to pin this on at first according to Penny. Now the sheriff says the complete opposite. He said he never said it was suicide. He has to keep all of his options open, which also is true. You do have to keep all your options open. But according to him, he had never said that he thought that this was a suicidal attempt. But Penny actually ended up hiring a private investigator for this about five days into the investigation, which is still very early into this investigation, mind you. So keep that in mind. And she hired this private investigator, his name was Philip Klein, I believe, to try and help track down the location of Thomas. All Penny wanted was as much possibility as she could to help locating her son. So now let's go back to the car for a second, Thomas's car. Like I said, Thomas drove a red Dodge Durango. And when the investigators went in and completely searched the car, they did find blood. And this is where the private investigator and the sheriff have, have conflicting opinions as well. According to the sheriff, he says that the blood was not new and that it was about as small as a paper cut and that it definitely couldn't have been from the night that Thomas went missing. According to the private investigator though, he says the opposite. The private investigator says that the blood could very well be from a struggle that Thomas endured that night and it should not be taken lightly at all. Personally for me, I find this next part even crazier though because the second thing that they found in this car was a shell case. Shell casing from a 25 caliber pistol. This car is so crucial to this investigation. There is just so much that should be looked into when it comes to this car, especially after finding blood and a shell casing. Penny was given the car back within just hours of it being found, which is way, way, way too short of a time. And I watched an interview with Penny and she just said that it was extremely odd. Usually in cases it takes way longer, especially when it was the last thing, like that is your biggest clue right now is this car. And to what it seemed to be to just do a little glance over the car, find these two things and then give it back is just completely, just, it's not, it's not right. So police started draining water areas in this area because it was around a lake. So they started draining all these little water areas that they could but they came up with nothing. The police and Penny just felt like they were going in circles in this investigation because they had no leads. They had no idea what drove Thomas to be here, if it was Thomas that drove himself here or if it was someone who forced Thomas to drive here. About two months into this investigation though, they ended up with their second clue. So there was an oil worker out working one day about four miles away from where Thomas's car was found. And while he was working, he ended up finding a backpack. This backpack was found on the opposite side of a barbed wired fence that ended up leading to Lake Marvin. The police were obviously called and when they showed up they were able to confirm that the backpack did belong to Thomas. What was really really odd about this though is that everyone in the community had been searching for Thomas since the day he went missing. They were searching in the miles that were surrounding his car and this was not very far away from his car and having searched for two months especially in this exact same area and no one saw this police just didn't believe it and everyone was convinced at that point that that backpack was specifically placed there. The backpack was in really bad condition though. It was soaking wet. On the inside of the backpack were papers which were starting to mold because they were so old. The backpack also had Thomas's laptop in it which had seemed to be unused at that point since the last time Thomas had used it. And what's so frustrating about this was because of how bad of a condition that the backpack was in, police were unable to use it as evidence and try to test it for DNA. Police's next idea in this investigation was to start looking at some of the surveillance cameras that surrounded the town and seeing if there was any possibility that Thomas's car might have drove past them. I'm sure you've already thought of this. I did too when I was reading this case and there's unfortunately no surveillance cameras at that gas station. So no one is able to know if something happened at that gas station, if he ran into the wrong person or if someone was waiting there. Like we just don't know. The possibilities are endless. But even though there were no cameras at the gas station, there was one sighting of his car. There was one possible sighting of his car between 4.41 in the morning and 4.43 in the morning. Now let me just explain that real quick because I know there's probably a lot of questions about that. Because at the time of more Morning it was it was so early in the morning it was still dark outside the camera wasn't able to pick up if there was anyone else in that car with him the brights were also on as well and they actually aren't even fully able to say that that was Thomas's car it's just a car that looked like Thomas's and the camera was black and white and it was already nighttime so who knows if that was actually Thomas's car to begin with or what a picture kind of brings up more questions than it does answers at six o'clock that morning though there was also another sighting there was a rec center like a recreational center in the town of Canadian near the water treatment facility 
and like Marvin all where Thomas's car was found and at about 6 in the morning there is surveillance video footage of a car that again looks similar to Thomas's driving in the direction of Lake Marvin. That's where his car ended up being found about two hours later. To me that is very confusing considering the fact that the police were called at 3 30 in the morning. Thomas's mom and his brother were out looking for him all night. Police said that they were searching for him throughout the night. Like it just does not make sense to me how if he was driving around this whole time and the town is so small how did no one find him? So now let me get into a little bit more detail about what I was vaguely talking about earlier with the sheriff. So the sheriff's name is Nathan Lewis. Nathan Lewis like I said had been newly elected sheriff into the county of Canadian. That in no way disqualifies him from being capable of doing this job at all. I don't think that has really anything to do with it. There are certain things though about this case and and the police involvement in this case though that just seem a little sketchy. For example, Penny actually ended up filing a lawsuit against, I couldn't figure out if it was the sheriff's department in general or if it was just against Nathan Lewis because the sheriff was actually withholding information from Penny. The sheriff has said before that, that he does not want this case to go public. He doesn't want it to be publicized. He doesn't really want it to be talked about. He kind of just wants the people on the inside to do the job and to figure it out and to nail whoever did this. And that because it's an ongoing investigation, it doesn't need to be publicized. But the reason this lawsuit was filed is because the sheriff was actually withholding information from the family. According to him, he has information, he has evidence, he has insight to what he thinks happened or what's going on, and he refused to tell the family. He defends this by saying he wants to get all his information super tied up in a row and just really tight and, and everything very organized so that when he does present it and when they do make new leads that he has everything covered. It's one thing to withhold evidence from the public. If you have your reasons, okay, that's fine, but to withhold evidence from from the family, from the mother whose child is missing, from the mother who has answers about what happened to her son, I think is completely unacceptable. I never really put my personal opinions in these videos just because I like to give you guys full unbiased story, but personally, that's just something that I can't let go. Like, I just think that that is absolutely ridiculous. And so did Penny, and that's why she filed a lawsuit against him. In October of 2017, so, so about one month before the anniversary of Thomas's disappearance, the community conducted another search party. And in the search party, they found Thomas his cell phone. They also found clothes and a pistol pouch. Pistol pouch would explain the shell casing in the car. Whose gun it was I wasn't able to figure out. When or why it was shot obviously is still up in question as well. Thomas's cell phone was found nine miles away from his car. So in an overview of the first year that Thomas went missing, there really was no leads. There was no suspect. There was no people of interest. At least that was released. Like I said, the sheriff on this case is super, super adamant on keeping this case super private and says that he has all this information. So they're very well could be several people of interest that we just don't know about, but as far as publicized, there was none. Everyone was still living with the idea that Thomas was still alive. However, as time continued to pass and as months and as years continued to pass, that hope, it was hard to hold on to and it slowly started to fade away. Now here is where the updates of this case come in. So on January 9th, 2019, so about a month and a half ago, we're talking this year, there was a man walking down a path in Lake Marvin. And according to this man, he noticed something was a little off about this area that he was in, so he decided to call the police. And when police arrived at the scene, they were able to identify what this man found to be human remains. With this case being so prevalent in the Canadian community, everyone kind of knew it was Thomas, but without forensic testing, no one was able to be 100% certain. But on January 15th, it was confirmed that the remains found at Lake Marvin were those of Thomas Brown. So the biggest question here was how did this area get looked over? Nathan Lewis said that him and the investigators on this case hadn't necessarily looked in that specific area yet. They were planning on getting to it. Lake Marvin itself is a very large area. It's about six 63 acres and so that's very very large however over the course of three years it was never searched that specific area where Thomas's remains were found was never searched what's crazy to me I think personally is that they had dogs searching this area they had bunches of search parties and investigators on this but this one specific area was not looked at why I don't know so Philip Klein the private investigator has said that the next steps in this case now are really looking over all the evidence with the fine tooth comb again he believes that 11 38 p.m. to 12 05 a.m. is a very, very crucial time in this case. 11.38 p.m. is when the card was swiped at the gas station. Obviously, this no longer is a missing persons case. It's unfortunately a homicide case. There was a $12,000 reward put out for Thomas's disappearance for anyone that could help locate him or had tips as to what could have happened or where he could be. But now having this be a homicide case, that $12,000 is, is now turning into a reward for 
information if anyone has anything that could help them lead to what happened to Thomas that night. And as far as information goes, you guys, really is all that is out there right now, which is I know is super frustrating because it's like you just, you feel like there has to be more, like there has to be something more. And I think that is the one thing that the police and Penny, Thomas's mom, have been able to agree on is that having Canadian be such a small town, having it be the size that it is in the type of community where everyone knows everyone, someone has to know something. And I think that's very, very prevalent in this case. Someone either knows someone who knows something or there's a person out there who either knows someone who knows something or someone who is a person who knows something. And this is just a PSA for everyone. Like there is, there are anonymous tip lines that you can call in anonymously and give your information that could hopefully help lead to answers for these families who just want answers. Someone knows something about what happened to Thomas. And I think it's so crucial now more than ever to get him, keep having his name out there, get people talking again. All right, you guys, that is the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed another true crime video. If you're new to my channel, hi, my name's Savannah. I make videos three days a week, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. You should subscribe, join the family. I love you guys so much. And I'll be back in a couple days with a brand new video. Bye guys.